All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to EPR for Carpet, Extended Producer Responsibility, Opportunities and Impact, a Northeast Recycling Council seminar. I'm Megan Fontes, Executive Director of NERC, or Northeast Recycling Council. And our mission is to minimize waste, conserve natural resources, and advance a sustainable economy through facilitated collaboration and action. Seminars is one way that we do this. Um, they are offered at no cost. They're open to anyone interested in learning more about these topics. Um, a quick overview of the agenda on the next slide. Um, we'll start with brief introductions and then we will move to presentations by our expert speakers and then we'll open up to Q&A. So the full seminar is an hour long. And before we get started, just some quick housekeeping details that please note this seminar is being recorded using a Zoom meeting, so please remain on mute with your video camera turned off for the entire duration. And please use the chat box to submit any questions you have. We will reply to them um, following the presentations. And a recording of the seminar and a copy of the presentations will be available on our website, and you'll receive an email with a link to those. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Um, first up, we have Garth Hickel. He's managing partner at Signal Fire Group. And second, we will have Don M. Tim, Director of Division of Environmental Solid Waste at Niagara County Department of Public Works. And lastly, we'll have David Bender, Chief Executive Officer of Circular Polymers by Ascend. So now I'll hand it over to Garth. Great. Well, well, thank you, Megan. And I really want to acknowledge NERC uh, for hosting this webinar today. This is a kind of a product category that has been percolating for uh, EPR for quite some time in the U.S. And so I'm really excited about kind of the resurgence of interest um, in carpet and really want to acknowledge uh, New York for taking a leadership role in moving forward EPR for carpet um, uh, the, in the last session, um, and really look forward to Dawn's presentation and discussion today. Next slide. So just on a kind of brief background, uh, the, the issue it really uh, came onto the scene nationally um, in 1999. At that point, several of the carpet companies, primarily in the commercial sector interface, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, um, was really using sustainability as a key selling point in the marketplace. And so um, as a result of that, combined with the growing acknowledgement um, at the municipal and state level around the amount of carpet that was being disposed and the economic opportunities associated with building recycling infrastructure, uh, the National Carpet Dialogue was initiated, um, and that uh, uh, unfolded for about uh, three years in kind of multi-stakeholder format and culminated with the National Carpet Recycling Agreement in 2020. In 2002. Uh, that agreement had an actual schedule of recycling goals, um, indicated that the producers were to assume primary financing responsibility um, for managing carpet at end of life, and the signatories included US EPA, uh, the Carpet and Rug Institute, which is the uh, trade association for the carpet industry, NERC, um, Lynn Rubenstein um, uh, was a key figure in those negotiations, and then a handful of individual states. Um, unfortunately, um, while we'd really hoped that this would set the table for um, kind of aggressive action on carpet recycling and with an, with an EPR emphasis in particular, that did not really come about. Uh, next slide. Um, just really quickly, in terms of some of the background, there's about approximately 80 producers um, of carpet, um, all of which are uh, primarily located in the United States. So it's really different from some of the other product, product categories that have been considered for EPR. Um, typically, uh, uh, the face fiber, so the actual 
portion of the carpet that you actually see is either PET or nylon. Um, and do want to acknowledge that there is increasing competition from other flooring types, uh, particularly in the residential sector. And that's one of the kind of new dynamics that has emerged um, over the last several years. Um, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is there's very minimal municipal collection infrastructure for carpet um, in the United States. So again, kind of a departure from uh, some of the other products uh, that have been considered or uh, addressed through an EPR mechanism. And lastly, is that the, 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 it does have a high greenhouse gas footprint. And so there are defined climate benefits um, associated with the collection and recycling of carpet. Next slide. So why do we need uh, carpet EPR? Um, the assumption is, is that you know, there's a significant amount of carpet waste that is generated annually. Almost all of that um, is landfilled, um, both in municipal solid waste landfills, as well as um, in the construction and demolition uh, disposal stream. About 9% of the carpet um, is recycled in the US, and the vast majority of that is coming out of California. Um, and then lastly, just kind of touching on data from a mo uh, one of the more recent um, state waste composition studies that was conducted in Wisconsin in, 2000, uh, in 2021, that about 44,000 tons of carpet was disposed and about another 5,800 tons of carpet pad uh, was des destined for disposal as well. So a significant volume uh, that is ending up in the disposal um, infrastructure. Next slide. So again, kind of why do we need EPR for carpet? Um, carpet recycling is just not economically self-sustaining without some um, additional financing mechanism. Um, it's very bulky and difficult to manage. Um, so again, it's not really well uh, uh, framed for um, the existing collection and recycling infrastructure. Um, EPR in California, which is the only state that it has a program implemented, um, has been proven effective at increasing recycling rates, supporting jobs, um, and creating businesses in carpet, in carpet recovery. And as you can see here from the kind of bar chart, um, California um, is up to about 32 percent um, uh, recycling rate, which is significantly higher from that of the national average. Next slide. So in terms of the existing EPR for carpet policy landscape, as I mentioned, uh, California moved forward in 2010. Uh, New York um, recently followed in 2022. And then we've had bill introductions in both Minnesota um, and Illinois in the last two years. Um, however, several states have seen uh, 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 bill introductions for carpet over the over the previous 20 years, um, although there's never really been a robust sustained effort um, and political alignment to allow those to move forward. Next slide. So next, we really need to focus on some of the next generation policy based on some of the lessons from California. As I mentioned, the California program has been su successful from a recycle from a collection and recycling standpoint. But we're recommending some changes in terms of how the California program is structured and functioning. One is to internalize the costs of the program so that the producers are actually directly assuming those costs and so that there's no visible fee for consumers. Uh, a visible fee um, adds, in, adds in several dynamics um, to an EPR system, including kind of over, uh, further oversight. Um, from the government agencies, as well as engagement from retailers, and really does not provide any additional benefit to the program. And so we feel that it really makes sense to have this um, inter cost internalization uh, approach. Another is actually ensuring that there's mandated goals um, at the initiation of the program. That was one um, aspect of the California program that was not in place when it was originally enacted in 22, 2010. So there really does need to be a series of clear guideposts um, and evaluative, evaluative measures um, at the start of the program. Next is collection convenience requirements. It's really ensuring that um, retailers, 
uh, construction and demolition firms, as well as individual res residents have access to collection infrastructure throughout the state. Um, another, and this is we've learned from several of the other EPR programs in place in the US is having a producer only governance structure is really key to ensure that there is that streamlined and clear accountability. Some of the mixed government regimes, the governance regimes that include recyclers and others along the product uh, along the product stream just really add in a layer of complication and without much benefit. And then lastly is a process for selecting a neat new PRO if for some reason that the, the, PR, the existing PRO or producer responsibility organization is simply not able to be able to fulfill the objectives of the program. Next slide. So in terms of best practices for other states and use building off New York as a model, um, obviously a lot of what I just reiterated in terms of those lessons learned um, should be incorporated from our perspective into policy can considered at the state level. Um, a couple other uh, specific items around recycled content. So ensuring that new product that is sold in the state does have a uh, PCR or post-consumer content um, uh, to it. Um, also restrictions on PFAS um, or commonly known as forever chemicals and requirements for adhesives to ensure that um, the adhesives that are being used are as environmentally friendly as possible. And lastly, on requirements for government procurement so that the government can really serve in a leadership role to help provide those defined signals to the producers around the importance of increasing recycled content as well as um, eliminating PFAS and um, using um, appropriate adhesives. So in terms of some of the projected impacts is that this is that we estimate that with ex expanded policy activity, 25% of carpet could be recycled na nationwide within four years. And this would have significant impacts and beneficial impacts um, on CO2 emissions per year, equivalent to taking, uh, taking about 250,000 cars off the road. Um, and as well as disposal cost savings, uh, job creation, um, and so forth. So again, um, carpet is really high value from both an environmental as well as an economic development standpoint. And that concludes my remarks. Look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I am Don Tim. I am the uh, Director of Environmental and Solid Waste in Niagara County, New York. Um, to give you better geographic representation of that, if you think of Niagara Falls, uh, that is right where I am. And also, I am the Chair of the New York Product Stewardship Council. And today, primarily, what I can provide and offer is um, the local government uh, perspective and the impacts of New York's carpet policy. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll build on much of what Garth um, had laid out in, in his presentation, um, but we can talk about New York's enactment uh, of the law, some of the key provisions and the timeline that is set forth. Next slide, please. Next slide. Splendid, thanks. Uh, this is a bit redundant of um, from what uh, Garth had indicated, but you know, truthfully, um, we're following the flow of waste in the state of New York. Uh, very little um, is obviously recycled, hence uh, the rationale for um, coming up with policy that will increase um, the amount, the volume of carpet that is finding its way into the recycling stream. Um, New York solid waste infrastructure uh, predominantly consists of uh, landfilling. Um, and then we do have some um, waste to energy uh, facilities in the state. Uh, but more importantly, and what's not necessarily represented on this slide is that you know, from a local government perspective, um, there is also effort to, uh, from a residential point uh, portion, to collect it from its source. You know, if this is a residential source, this is often placed out for collection where it becomes bulky um, and you know, has its added weight and becomes an expense uh, for local governments. Um, and, you know, there's not always, um, you know, not, that's not always the most efficient manner in, in which to handle our material. Next slide, please. 
so uh you know why carpet uh there's there's quite a few reasons and certainly uh you know garth ran through those the the same rationale that exists for the state of new york certainly exists um uh, uh for the entire nation you know it's uh, it's of particular importance that in New York, that we are transitioning, you know, from the definition of waste as we traditionally know it, waste just meaning we generate it, it goes somewhere um, forever. Uh, and we kind of transform that into resource. And um, that is good for the economy. You know, just uh, as indicated here, we're looking at you know, uh, re reaching our target goals of 30% of recycling, you know, would save businesses $5 million per year in disposal costs. Um, and also of note of importance is that there's far more of an economic stimulus that exists when we are collecting material and uh, processing it, dismantling, creating, and then marketing it in a new product. Um, there is also uh, the benefit to the environment. You know, we, we don't always, you know, what doesn't always come to mind is that the amount of plastics that uh, are in carpet or mostly carpet um, and the opportunity here to um, feed a circular economy and create more textiles, such as uh, our composite lumber and other opportunities from our wasted carpet. And uh, you know, what's of particular importance as well to the state of New York most recently is that we have our Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which has very significant targets and aggressive targets for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and anything that targets um, greenhouse gases and removing um, what we're emitting is extremely beneficial in reaching our goals. And again, reaching our 30% recycling um, has the ability to pull close to 40,000 cars off the road and sets us uh, well on our way to, uh, to our goals. Next slide, please. So we were um, fortunate uh, here in the state of New York to have the political will to tackle this issue. Um, our former governor Cuomo had proposed it in budget in 2020. Um, and, and all of us know what happened in 2020. We all sidetracked with a, with a few different public health concerns. Um, but um, the proposals that were, you know, garnered a lot of support from carpet recyclers. And I know that we will we'll hear from David um, after, after I speak. Uh, and of course, environmental advocates uh, and recycling groups, you know, began to work together and, and devise a pro an approach. We found that um, in 2002, we had a bill and we had uh, same as sponsors in both our Senate and our assembly. And um, it had passed in, in, in some of the behind the scenes information is that we were holding our breath for a little bit here in the state of New York because there were some amendments that were required and the governor um, was uh, apprehensive to sign until some chapter amendments were, were made. And essentially uh, the backstory on that is the environmental community um, had an idea or a definition of recycling that was included in the bill. And then there becomes the reality, the intent of how can we actually uh, meet that definition of recycling if we do not allow um, you know, for some specific technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, just to, to run through uh, very briefly, you know, some of the important parts um, of, of our bill, uh, very you know, traditional in the sense of, of EPR, looking to enhance performance um, and convenience. You know, we want to be sure that we are recycling um, at the rates that are set forth. Um, you know, we're fostering a circular economy that there is um, access and convenience for anybody. Um, the, the term I often use in New York is that from Niagara Falls to Long Island. Uh, we want everyone in between to have access um, to find a location to recycle their carpet. Um, and because of the unique characteristics of New York, where we have New York City uh, with population um, of, of 20 million, of course, in a, in a smaller area, um, they have to have a specific convenience standard due to their density. Um, environmental. Um, standards. It's important to phase out PFAS. Um, we, we recognize that if there are PFAS in production, there, goes, there are going to be PFAS in the recycling end. And in order to eliminate PFAS um, in, in the post-consumer content or at the recycling end, they need to be eliminated in production. So we've included those. Um, and of course, post-consumer content standards, uh, always important in the sense that we want to be sure that if we're going to introduce material into the market that there is demand for that material and a use for that material. Next slide, please. 
So uh, continuing on um, in the vein of, of key provisions, obviously funding is extremely important. Um, the producers are responsible for the cost. This is a cost internalization model that you, um, anyone buying carpet in the state of New York will not necessarily see a fee um, on a receipt or something of that nature. Um, and the producers will pay these costs and for not only the administration, but the enforcement component. Governance. Um, it's important that there is a structure there for continuous improvement and evolution and input into the, the governance. We want to make sure that all parties are represented in meeting goals and standards um, and that plans are developed. Uh, and there's a carpeted stewardship advisory board, which uh, accounts for um, a broad range of representatives. We have the ENGO community. We have local governments like myself. Uh, we have recyclers, transporters, et cetera. Next slide, please. So uh, there, there's a lot here, but I just want to call out, um, uh, you know, a few important pieces. You know, with any EPR policy, you certainly want to allow a certain amount of onboarding time. Um, and this will go into effect in two years. So uh, 2023, we signed it. Plans should be submitted by the conclusion of 2025. Um, there is a PFAB ban, as indicated. We're looking at 2026 for that and starting to ramp up on some of our post-consumer content requirements. Um, you know, each of each of these um, timeline um, goals are certainly meant as a means to continuously foster the program and let it let it to you know, let it evolve uh, to something that is functional and useful with uh, very achievable and logical benchmarks. Next slide, please. Um, at the at the end, the next slide. I think we have two 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 closing thoughts slides here. Um. I mentioned in the beginning that uh, carpet EPR was the first policy um, that really contributes to New York's climate action plan. And this is of particular importance, like I said, we are, we are embarking on a very aggressive plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and um, you know, tackling all sectors um, uh, of GHG generation. We have energy, transportation, waste, industry, agriculture. Um, so here, you know, this, this is, uh, this is a landmark piece for us in the sense that um, we're tackling uh, carpet and has its, you know, assignable GHG emission component. Um, we hope this works to build momentum um, from carpets and gain uh, into other EPR programs. Uh, for for any of uh, the New York packaging fans out there, if you're on, uh, you know, there's the definition of recycling, which we certainly hoped would set the stage for how um, how future policy is shaped as it relates to uh, chemical recycling and the definition of recycling. And uh, the New York Product Stewardship Council, um, as always, is looking forward to working with recyclers and manufacturers and anyone across New York and, and truthfully the country to build you know, efficient and effective programs and specifically looking at uh, carpet recycling. Um, you know, I, I'm from a, a community that prides itself upon economic development. And these are the types of opportunities where we are targeting a specific portion of the waste stream and know that there can be an economic stimulus that's associated with um, carpet recycling, uh, job creation from that. And we want people to live, grow and prosper here in the state of New York. And um, I have a, a final ending slide here for, for anyone interested in the New York Product Stewardship Council or uh, learning more about what we do here. You're certainly welcome to visit our website or contact me. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to those people on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> car carpet EPR is very interesting because it hits on the three key pillars and is executable today. Those being collection, processing, and markets. We'll talk about all three of those. And then we're actually gonna give you a tour of our facility so you can see exactly how carpet gets recycled and put back into the circular economy. Next slide, please. So I think as most of you know, carpet is plastic. Carpet is plastic and there is four to five billion pounds that gets landfilled annually in North America. Um, we're very fortunate as that circular polymers is commercialized a disruptive technology that reclaims the fibers to unleash their circular value. And 
you know, we're in the mid 90s in terms of recovery rate, which is absolutely outstanding. And all of that material goes back to the circular economy. Next slide, please. All right, so how, how do we collect this? All right, so, <clears throat> you know, we are basically placing can trailers at carpet stores, transfer stations, landfills. Um, there's actually, um, <clears throat> you know, certain public drop-off sites that we, or in this case, the PRO, the Carpet America Recovery Effort is set up. And depending upon the location, you know, we try to be as flexible as possible for that particular site location. And in some cases, you know, just from a space consideration, we've had to go smaller and have partnered with pods, the same, um, <clears throat> you know, the national uh, moving company uh, is actually a wonderful, uh, is really a, a wonderful opportunity to place smaller containers where they just have no, where they just have no space. And that's how the picture is basically how our carpet comes in, in rolls. Next, next slide, please. So we have a large plant in Lincoln, California. Um, we have two production lines uh, converting the waste carpet into fiber and a production line converting the fiber to a densified pellet. Uh, we also go to melt filtered pellets um, <clears throat> uh, and we, uh, we, we, we use outside vendors to do that. We have additional expansion planned as we continue to increase our raw materials. Next slide, please. All right, so how do we do this, all right? So <clears throat> I draw your attention to, the, to uh, the right hand side of the screen where carpet is basically a primary face fiber, which is usually nylon or PET, sometimes polypropylene. And there's a backing fiber, which is again, usually polypropylene. And there's basically a whole bunch of calcium carbonate um, and some adhesive. And what we do is literally disassemble the carpet so that we're able to sell all of the plastic, <clears throat> plastic polymer fibers that are in the carpet, as well as market the calcium carbonate that's in, that's in the backing. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here's what our products look like. Product, the product on the left-hand side is our standard fiber that gets produced after going through our technology. In some cases, we can actually open that fiber um, <clears throat> and make it more look like cotton candy for certain market applications. Um, normally, okay, on the right-hand side is kind of the ubiquitous um, uh, polymer pellets that one sees that might be more familiar on the virgin side. Uh, there's two types. Uh, one is melt filtered pellets, which is the common one, but then there's one called the densified pellet. And, you know, there's many applications that can take that, and we use significantly less energy to create that pellet as well. It's, again, excellent for the environment. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this was actually, I think, already in, in the chat in terms of questions, but, you know, where does, where does this go to? And, you know, it's really very fortunate that um, <clears throat> there's been tremendous headway surrounding markets for the polymers that we produce. And on the polypropylene side, it can go into standard injection molding applications, consumer packaging, um, nylon can go into automotive, textile, fiber, compounding, industrial, e-mobility. On the PET side, there is uh, composite lumber, textiles, packaging, pallets, non-woven fiber. Um, one of the major players uses a kissing cousin to PET, it's called PTT. And again, that goes into composite lumber and non-woven fiber. And then all that calcium carbonate, which is basically sand, can go into road materials and filler. So we're, we're pretty proud of all of the applications and markets that we have found. Um, uh, Ascend has helped us tremendously on the nylon side in terms of you know, finding markets for that product. But we've been very fortunate to work with, you know, so many wonderful customers in industry who are now embracing the circular economy and working hard to utilize um, our product. Next slide, please. 
So let's go on a plant tour before we take a whole bunch of questions. At Circle of Polymers, we're incredibly honored to have received innovation awards from the California Product Stewardship Council, the Carpet America Recovery Effort, the Association for Plastic Recyclers, and the Plastic Industry Association. Circular Polymers has a 150,000 square foot processing facility in Lincoln, California. Every day we're receiving post-consumer carpet from installers, retailers, landfills, and transfer stations. The first step in the process is to actually segregate the different plastic types that carpet is made from. Nylon, PET, and polypropylene primarily. And using the FTIR technology, we're able to identify it and then separate it into the individual polymers. And we actually put it into something we, reflect, we affectionately refer to as a bunker. Once the product is segregated, we're then able to run each of the different polymer types. So we talked about the segregation and homogenization of the carpet that comes in. Let's move on to the next section of the plant which is the conversion of the carpet into a fiber raw material. As most of you know, carpet is strictly plastic, sand, and glue. So in this step in the process, what we're doing is we are feeding the carpet, the whole carpet, into a series of shredders. And this is all about size reducing the carpet. Um, the first shredder cuts it into strips and the second shredder, as you can see, puts it into chunks, but you still have the sand and the glue attached to the carpet. Now with circular polymers, we believe in using the least amount of energy to create the product. That's one of the hallmarks of our technology. In this case, as you can see, there's no water or chemical used, um, another major innovation in terms of carpet recycling. And in here, we're feeding these chunks of carpet into a surge bin with the idea of ensuring that as we feed it into the principal technology that we do it in an even flow and an, an even flow basis. And as you can see, again, chunks of whole carpet with still the backing on it. So this is um, our proprietary technology. We refer to it as rise technology. We've actually automated the software and you can see the controls here. It's important that we, um, quality is very important to our process. We're all about quality and the software allows us to do that. So as we now move into the main technology, we call it RISE, Rotary Impact Separation. And what makes our technology unique is we're actually deconstructing the carpet. We're actually removing the sand and the glue and we're left specifically with the plastic fiber. And we're gonna go through a series of rotary impact separators and each step along the way is going to further refine the fiber, removing more and more of the sand and the glue. And ultimately, we're gonna remove 95% of the sand and the glue. And each step along the way, you can see it looking more and more fibrous with less sand and less glue. One of the interesting pieces of our technology is that the friction that is created inside the rise units, in addition to the heat that's generated, actually cleans the carpet. Think of it as similar to a dry cleaning process, but without chemicals. And we're literally just using the friction to create and remove those outer surfaces and clean those outer surfaces to improve the quality of our polymer. So now that we've deconstructed the fiber and from the sand and the glue, we send it over to the baler where a thousand pound block of fibrous polymer is created. But we utilize the entire carpet and in fact, the sand and the glue, we actually turn into a product itself. And this is what the sand and glue look like. And again, it's almost all calcium carbonate and we sell this product as well.
This is a picture of some of the finished goods that we have in our warehouse, different types of fiber bales with different polymers. We're very focused in on quality. We test every bale that goes in the that gets manufactured by the plant. We lot control everything. We can literally have traceability back to the raw material that came in. And we're very proud of the consistent quality that we make on an ongoing basis. If we choose to, some customers request that we further refine the bales of fiber into a densified pellet. Uh, that enables us to go into further upcycling in terms of certain applications. And what a densified pellet is, is it's the conversion of the fiber into, we're not actually melting it, all right, we're actually compressing the fiber together to produce a product that looks a little bit like kitty litter, but it enables us to go into some compounding and other high-end applications for the circular economy. We hope you enjoyed a quick tour of our facility in Lincoln, California. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Garth. Um, very excited to open it up to Q and A. Um, do we want to stop doing the screen share at this point? Perfect. Um, so let me see what we have here. We got a lot of questions that came in. Um, one of them: What is the convenience standard for New York City? Is that a Don question? Sure, um, I can I can address that. Um, the The baseline convenience standard is that counties with ten thousand or more must have one collection site, and then a an additional collection site for every thirty thousand in population. So for New York, for New York City specifically, the Department of Sanitation uh, can consult with the DEC to arrive at a standard that best meets the needs. Thank you. Um, David, will we be able to share that link to that video after the presentation? Uh, we can figure out some way to do that. Perfect, great. Um, are you able to share any vendors that folks can use? Uh, so, it, so there's two pieces of this, right? One is the carpet retailers from a supply perspective. And the second is um, our customers. And unfortunately we don't share our customer lists. Yep. Um, the, um, let's see here. I guess for me, I was kind of interpreting that question as you know, for the consumer, where are the different areas you can, or where are the different <clears throat> facilities you can drop off to get your carpet recycled? So what we do is we work very closely with the PRO in California, that's the Carpet America Recovery Effort. So we both have our own, we work, so we work with the landfills and the transfer stations to get carpet from those locations, as well as individual retailers and installers. So carpet's really unique, right? 90, 96% of it, 97% of it is professionally installed. It's really not a DIY type of product. And in almost all cases, those installers are removing that carpet, not in all locations, but they're removing that carpet. And then we're trying to intercept it so it doesn't go into a waste bin, but goes into a recycling bin and then collecting it from those retail locations. So in California, uh, the Carpet America Recovery Effort actually has a um, <clears throat> uh, they have a they have a they have a map and a list of all of the public drop off locations, including our plant. Like literally, people show up with carpet at our plant, whether they be individuals or or um, uh, or retailers. But there's you know well over a hundred drop off sites in the state of California, plus all the individual retail locations. Thank you. Um, I think this is also probably a question for you. How do you separate nylon and PET if there's blended fiber carpet? So um, they're really, they're, they're, 
up until this point, there have not been a lot of blends. There are some blends coming. And um, today we use the FTIR technology to identify what polymer it is. And um, <clears throat> in the future, we will have that capability to look at blends pretty carefully. Um, on the flip side, we work with the industry or we're trying to work with the industry to have less blends to have greater design for recyclability. Thank you. Do you do you know the environmental impact of the recycling process from collection to production of a new product? So the LCA really depends upon what product you're going to. It literally varies by polymer, and you know some of some of the um, some of our customers are have taken that very very seriously and have studied it. Um, and you know there are ranges out there, but usually it's um, from usually it's a greater than eighty percent CO two savings and greater than 75% energy savings, but those numbers can go, you know, those go, those numbers can go significantly higher as well. Garth, you want to add to that at all? No, I think that you handled that well, thank you. All right, we got a lot for Ascend, so I'm going to try to keep those grouped together. <laughs> so um, do you receive and recycle carpet padding? And could your facility recycle artificial turf? That's two questions in one for you. So there's a pretty significant um, supply chain already regarding padding um, and <clears throat> regarding the, recy the recycling of, of pad. Um, and we, if rebond pad is the primary type that is recyclable and, and um, we, we collect it, homogenize it, bale it, and send it on to a converter who is going to um, create new pad from pad. So we look, for, you know, we, we do that, we do that today. In regards to field turf, we've been working very, very closely with one of the leaders in field turf in North America. And um, yes, our technology is very effective at recycling field turf. That's great. Um... Are you able to share anything around the technology that you that's used to identify the different fiber types of carpet? So, so it's actually uh, it's it's actually a standard technology that's in the marketplace. It's called F, it's called FTIR. Um, it's similar to what um, the PET, the polypropylene, the polyethylene uh, company re recyclers, or we call actually reclaimers, do. Um, and but because of the bulk of carpet, we tend to use handhelds versus maybe the bottle people who will send it on conveyors and then and then eject via air that technology. But it's it's that same near and mid range FTIR that is going to uh, the infrared technology. But there's many companies who make those products today. Thank you. Um, do you have a percent on average of, you know, plastic versus the sand and glue? I think um, uh, probably the best way to look at it is it's kind of two thirds plastic and one third calcium carbonate. Great, awesome questions. Um, what's your collection criteria for rugs? How do you ensure you're not getting any wool or natural fiber rugs? So today the, today, the EPR has been strictly on wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Um, rugs is, you know, <clears throat> a logical next step in the, in, the EPR market, in the EPR marketplace. But again, we can identify that face fiber type and, you know, we look forward to that kind of expansion as we, as we continue to dive deeper in the circular economy. Thanks. And then I'm just going to ask another question for you before we move on to some of the um, policy questions. Um, what what protection is in place for employees to protect them from airborne particulates generated by the recycling process? So a safety question. Yep, that's a that's a great question. First and foremost, you know, we work very hard so that to, to ensure our employees health and have proper you know, have proper dust and air collection in our facilities. And then on top of that, um, uh, they were masks. But, um, but again, we're very fortunate in the fact that we have a dry process with no chemicals. And again, we're, we're, we're then sucking all those 
all of those particulates from the process and and uh, and and collecting anything that may have escaped. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, so here's a question. This is really open to any of you. Who would be responsible for dropping off the carpets at collection sites? Would carpet installers have this responsibility? What would happen with currently installed carpets with PFAS? Can that still be recycled and used uh, thereafter? So I don't know who, who could speak to that. Sort of two question, two-folded question. Garth or Dawn, you want to take the first part? Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna have Garth go and fill in there. <laughs> well, sure. Um, I, there is there. You know, <clears throat> generally, uh, installers will have a requirement to take back carpet um, if they are installing new carpet. Um, so that's certainly one one pathway in terms of directly moving that material to collection points or directly to a processor. Um, but again, you know, there's obviously carpet that'll be managed by individual uh, residents and so forth. And so that's why part of the reason why that convenience standard is really important to ensure that that broad collection uh, net network exists uh, to be able to um, you know, handle that kind of one off, if you will, uh, residentially generated material. Right. And I think that sort of gets to one of the questions, which is, you know, what's, how is the obstacle to collecting the carpet that's being generated by residents being addressed so that it doesn't just end up in landfill um, for people that don't want to hang on to their carpets and want to get rid of it quickly? If anyone has, if anyone wants to expand upon that and, you know, perhaps around what so, educational efforts. So there's just, there's a couple things. First of all, as I said, since, since, you know, more than 90% of carpet is professionally installed, most of the time the installers are removing the old carpet and <clears throat> they're going back to their warehouse or retail location and putting that in, into a very, very large dumpster. We're intercepting it there or they're taking it to a landfill or transfer station. But, you know, we were able to, in most cases, solve the, the home situation. You know, the, you know, Amazon refers to the last mile. In our situation, it's the first mile. And that's one of the reasons why carpet is so effective and we have that ability. And then from a, from a retailer perspective, they're saving money. I mean, landfilling anything is very expensive these days and there's significant savings to them to, um, to uh, recycle it versus to uh, to landfill. So besides doing the right thing for the planet, besides doing the right thing for the circular economy, there's there's also a cost savings at the retailer installer level, or or and that also you know applies to people like landfills and tr and transfer stations. Thank you. Um. What percentage of plastic is lost with the filler portion of the stream, i.e. yield loss, is significant? Okay, so I, I think the question has to do here with um, our calcium carbonate and if there's any plastic in the calcium in the calcium carbonate. And um, uh, today it's it's very, very it's very insignificant, you know, low single digit percentages. Um, there are reclaimers, some of my peer group, okay, you could actually process that again to remove all, almost all of the polymer so that it's an absolute pure calcium carbonate stream. Thank you. With the extremely high greenhouse gas emission reduction benefit from recycling carpet, has there been any lobbying on the federal level for facility funding or incentives for recycling carpet? Is there any facility funding in the climate action components in the Inflation Reduction Act? Garth, are you want to take a whack at that? I, I am not aware of any, but that certainly doesn't mean that, that, that Congress hasn't moved forward and done some, done some kind of broad uh, appropriation for support for recycling programs. Um, how much of that, you know, will be eligible for 
uh, carpet relative to all other product categories? I, d I don't know. Um, and then I don't know if Don, you could speak to a little bit about how did you ensure the complementary minimum recycled content goals are reasonably achievable? You know, I was thinking about that in, um, I think, you know, in, in that circumstance, you're ultimately looking at precedence that's been set, right? Um, and looking to the state of California, where we have some precedence about, um, you know, with policy that's been in place for some time, you know, helps us to, you know, gauge the, the reasonableness of those goals and targets. Thank you. And Garth, um, can you talk a little bit about why it's more effective to have the hidden fees to consumers as part of the policy? Sure. Yeah, I think um, so. So what we're really talking about is those kind of um, fees that are specifically delineated on the receipt or otherwise communicated to consumers at the point of sale. Um, a couple things. One is that that does place a, a, a significant burden on the retailers. Uh, the benefit of that is not clear, um, particularly as we're moving into um, uh, uh, receipt optional and kind of digital uh, receipts that are becoming more, more commonplace so that that kind of communication to consumers um, that has, you know, kind of assumed would travel with uh, that, that fee visibility um, is, you know, it, 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 we're, we're, certainly, we're certainly losing that. Um, now, this doesn't mean, obviously, that the PRO can't develop a a uh, clear set of fees that are paid by the producers based on a whole host of various factors for particular resin types and so forth. So that 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 is certainly supported and encouraged. But we've also seen in some of the fee pro visible fee programs that that there has been um, significant um, emphasis on what is the level of the fee rather than how the program is performing overall and making the assumption that a fee level then translates into program performance. Um, again, you know, we don't have uh, a, a, a objective evidence to be able to support that. So we really, you know, kind of support actually allowing the producers to determine what that fee schedule is um, and how much money needs to be raised and so forth, be able to uh, meet these statutory requirements. Environments. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, are municipals passing along any fees for recycling at their transfer stations? Um, or are residents able to drop it off? And we had another question about that, just confirming if what we have to pay to dispose of the carpet or not. In, in, in most cases, at least kind of speaking from my home state of Minnesota, that there is a fee or carpet that is dropped off by residents. And, and Garth, Garth or Dawn, you want to talk about how the New York bill handles it? Because I know it's a little different than the California bill in regards to collection. You can go ahead, Garth. No, Dawn, you you're New York. I will defer <laughs> to you. Sure. Um, I mean, we have the, the as I said earlier, the uh, convenience standards. Um, that are set set forth, right? So we'll have you know drop off locations, um, and I'll just talk specifically about Niagara County. You're know, looking at two hundred ten thousand residents, um, you know, so we should have seven drop off locations here, and you know, because it's yet to be passed, I can look to other EPR policies, um, specifically electronics. You know, you, there's an, an incentive. Um, to have those um, opportunities within your community, local government will do it. Uh, specific not-for-profits will do it um, to to provide for the convenience of bringing them there. Or honestly, it could be uh, retail. Um, you know, large carpet installers um, in, in the area. Um, you know, would in fact you know pick up that material. Or um, and other opportunities looking at self-help communities with their transfer station capabilities. You know, if I if I can just add that. That it, <clears throat> carpet EPR, the carpet EPR bills that are out there are all slightly different. Um, in many cases, in, in all cases, there's a significant cost savings over what is happening today. 
in some cases, it's all the way to free so that you can't, there's no, there's no charge at all. But again, that varies by EPR legislation. But like I said, the worst case is there's a significant savings over what is being done today for uh, retailers or individuals. Along that note, do you do you know the difference in cost between sending a carpet to Ascend, for example, versus landfill? So um, I think I think it it varies amongst the reclaimers. So not just circular polymers by Ascend, but others. And um, in uh, so at the retailer location, um, usually it's a savings of between fifty and one hundred percent. Um, in regards to savings for the installers and the retailers, um, in regards to um, in regards to landfills, it is a it is I'm sorry in transfer stations it is it is an absolute significant savings um, because they don't have to pay all the cost of the landfill yet they're also able to to you know <clears throat> have that incredible benefit of taking that product in how much they then pass it along to the consumers, uh, I don't, I'm, I can't, I can't speak to. Can someone, Maybe immune. Thank you. Can someone speak a little bit more to how manufacturers are involved in all of this? So I, I will tell you that has been an incredibly pleasant surprise uh, over the past two years, we we um, uh, circular polymers now circular polymers by Ascend works. I'm sorry, by, well, but I'm talking about customers here in regards to you know working closely with customers to try to have the right formulation so that they can use our product in their our product as a raw material in their in their overall products. And I'm not sure if you meant manufacturers by customers or manufacturers by carpet manufacturers. Yeah, I'm not sure, um, but thank you. So we are running out of time. Um, probably have room for one other question. Um, I, there's a few questions around PFAS. So it would be great if one of you could speak to, you know, David and Don, perhaps how you address, how, you, how you've been thinking about addressing PFAS um, and whether or not those materials can be recycled. So, Don, can you take the first part of the questions, which how the PFAS were, you know, <clears throat> how you handled it, how you how it was handled in New York? Sure. Well, well I mean, PFAS are, are part of a, a very broad discussion in the state of New York and looking at, uh, you know, their forever chemical and their persistence uh, in, in the natural environment. And it only makes sense that um, that requirements are added into policy that are going to mitigate the exposure to PFAS. Um, and, and the phase out is important, too, because we need if like like I said in my presentation, if we are recycling um, material that has PFAS in them, we're going to expect PFAS in the recycled content. So, uh, you know, our addressing was just trying to align it and become consistent um, with with the ambitions, you know, of, of our policy across New York State regarding uh, how we're handling PFAS. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we have to wrap up because we only have a minute left, but thank you for everyone, um, for all of our speakers and your presentations, sharing this really valuable information with us. Thank you for, for all those of those who attended. Um, we will be sending out a recording and the presentations uh, following the seminar and uh, apologies to those who we didn't get to. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks again.